The title of this message is Anxiousness. <laughs> My anxiousness started at 7.30 this morning when I began to get texts and phone calls about all the people who were sick today. <laughs> the stomach bug and sinus infections and back problems are no respecters of persons, you know? I'll read the scripture today and we will soon have Chuck to read. He was, we recorded this this week for him to read for us today. Um, but since they're, we're having a hard time with that, I'll go ahead and read that. I want to tell you a funny Chuck DePere story though before I do. Chuck wrote a very good little book on preaching. I mean, it's really good. And when I became the pastor here, before I actually even preached a message, in the hallway before I preached my first message as your pastor, he was, someone said, um, somebody needs to see you, they want to give you something, you know, at 10 to 11 or whatever, and I'm kind of scurrying around, and he hands me his book on preaching and says, I want you to be sure to get this before you preach a single message so you won't think I'm trying to tell you something. <laughs> so... <laughs> And so, but it was, you know, he didn't want me to take it the wrong way, I guess. Well, I want to read a short passage from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34. And these are Jesus' words to those gathered there. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the li lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Won't you join me for a moment of prayer? Gracious God, in these moments we come to you, and we ask for your direction and your guidance in our lives. We ask that you would touch our hearts and speak to us in ways that we understand. May the words of my mouth and may the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's children said, amen. In the 1970s, there was a very popular commercial that captured everybody's imagination. And I'm going to tell you how it went. A lady was dressed in a kind of a professional getup, and in the background behind her, there's this screen with, with this just random noise, with this chaos and conflict, with congestion, with barking. And she says, and she says, the traffic. She says, the boss. She says, the baby. She says, the dog. I've had enough of this. Do you remember what she said next? Calgon, take me away. <laughs> Do you remember that? Calgon, take me away. All of this noise, all of this confusion, all of this conflict, Calgon, take me away. And at that moment, the scene changes. And all of a sudden, this lady is in a, this lady is in a bubble bath and the music is playing quietly, and a deep voice says, Lose your cares. Soften your skin. Re-energize your spirit. Lose yourself in the lap of luxury. And the commercial goes on and on about Calgon. Y'all remember this, everybody who was alive in the 70s? Okay, that's not everybody in the room, I understand that. 
Well, that was a really, really popular commercial in the 1970s, but I don't know that it would go over well today because today they're just much simpler times. Is that not right? <laughs> so, this passage today begins with Jesus looking at his disciples and saying, don't worry. If you have a Bible that, that gives you subtitles for paragraphs or whatever, perhaps it says, do not worry or, or don't be anxious. And we remember when Jesus looked out at those disciples, um, we remember there were a lot of things that they could be potentially anxious about. I mean, just last week we were walking along beside the lake when Jesus called out to Peter and to Andrew and said, Hey, follow me. And they dropped their, they dropped their, um, their nets and they left the fish and they followed, not exactly knowing where Jesus would take them. Okay, and then Jesus went further down that sea or the lake shore, and he went to James and John and said, you've always fished for perch and for bass, but I can teach you to fish for people. Follow me. And so they left the fish and the nets, and they left their boats and their father and the hired men, and they followed not knowing exactly where they would go. Jesus said to them, do not worry. You know, now I joked about Calgon's commercial not having resonance today, but you know, I really think that would have some resonance today in our lives. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but this week, have you been exasperated? This week, have you been anxious about something? This week, have you needed to get away for a while? Has there been racket and confusion this week? Have you said, oh, I can't take it. I can't take it. You see, Jesus said to them, and I think he says to you and me, don't worry. Don't be anxious. I have a close friend who lives in Virginia. Michelle and I lived in Virginia the first probably eight or nine years of our marriage. And one day I met him in Richmond for lunch. Well, excuse me, I met him during the lunch hour. He said, now, I will, I'll eat before 12, and then we'll go to my favorite coffee shop at noon. I said, okay, so I ate before I got there. I got there at 11.58 to his desk, and at his desk, he pulls out a brown bag, opens it up, and he crams down a ham sandwich. In two minutes, there at his desk, and we eat his, he eats his potato chips walking toward the coffee shop, Okay. And we, we go to the coffee shop, and then he just sits down, and he orders a fancy schmancy coffee drink, which in the 90s was less than $3. You know, now it's more like $6. But I said, oh, well, they have food here, Rob. Why don't you get it? He said, I can't afford to get the food and get the coffee. He said, I eat a sandwich at my desk so I can take this retreat every single day. And so what would he do from 12 to 1? is he'd be at the coffee shop and he would either meet a friend or he would read or he'd just sit quietly. It was his daily break. And he said, I eat sandwiches at my desk in two minutes so that I can afford to do this break every single day. When Jesus looked out at his disciples, those people who were so anxious, he recognized something that we know. When we're anxious, when we're worried, when we fret... We, we can't be present where we're called to be. You know, we can't be the best for the people around us. We can't give our all to the task at hand. Um, when, we are, when we are fretting, we just can't really be there in the spot, in the moment. Um, and Jesus said, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Other things happen when we worry. Um, I heard about a little girl who went with her father to Disney World. And she was young at the time, but she was old enough and tall enough to ride Space Mountain, the roller coaster. And they go to Space Mountain, and it looks so interesting, and she's just tall enough to get on the cart to ride that, to ride that um, roller coaster. And, so, and he's like, gosh, I'm afraid she's not going to want to do this. No, she has a blast. All day, they ride it two or three times, and they just love this Space Mountain. And he just, you know, so three years later, he takes her back to Disney World, and they, and he's just dying to go ride Space Mountain again with his bigger girl. And they get there, 
you know, and, and they get, get ready to go in line for Space Mountain, and, and all of a sudden she says, Dad, I, I, don't, I don't know that I can do this now. And he goes, Honey, we were here three years ago, and you rode this three different times. We had a blast. And she said, But, Dad, I couldn't read then. And she pointed to the sign that says, You know, warning, don't get on this ride if you have shortness of breath or hypertension or high blood pressure, heart problems, backache, lower backache, upper backache, neck problems. This could be dangerous for you. You know, sometimes we recognize, you know, when we worry, um, we not only do we, are we not as present in the place that we've been called to be, uh, when we worry, we avoid things that perhaps would be really good for us or really fun. Um, um, Edward Schweitzer, in his commentary on Matthew, said, you know what worry does? It steals the joy from our lives. Um, it steals the joy. And so Jesus says to his disciples, and I think he says to you and me, do not worry. Don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. And we think, Jesus, worry is what our lives are all about. We go to work and we worry because of the co-workers. We go home and we worry because of school or sports. We go um, in our neighborhoods and we worry. We worry about what's in our wallets or what's not. We worry about the economy. Worry, worry, worry. One night this week, I wanted to catch up on a little bit of news. And so it got to be late. I opened my iPad. There are three or four news outlets that I look at to try to kind of get a good rounded view of what's going on in the world and I started just kind of reading articles shuffling through okay it got to be too late I read too many articles and I got way too anxious and you know and by the time I went to bed what my blood pressure's up my heart's you know my my stomach's nervous and I can't go to sleep and so the next day you know I'm just dragging and I said to Michelle I was like you know I, I shouldn't have been reading all that news last night and she said you all know better than that and I said, yeah, but it was, it was like I was watching this train wreck, and I couldn't take my eyes off of it, you know? Um, and, and I realized, you know, it, this is just the most anxious, anxious time all around. And, and to us now, right here, Jesus says, do not worry. The next day, I went into the church, and I began, well, I didn't begin, but I was doing some studying for this message, and I found a recording, um, a written record from another time when someone was talking about the most um, anxiety-producing things in their lives at that time. And here's what it read. Will I have enough money? Will I be able to feed my family? Will I get the contract? Will we be able to withstand the strength of our neighbors? Will I be elected to the council? And I go on and I read this, and then I realize, you want to guess what year that was written? 100 A.D. 100 A.D. Um, Jesus looked out at his disciples before 100 A.D., but I'm saying this has been going on for 2,000 years, and said, don't worry. Don't worry. And then Jesus did something masterful there. They're there beside the Sea of Galilee. The warm breeze is blowing up from the lake. And he says, consider the birds of the air. They don't sow. They don't reap. They don't gather in barns, yet your father clothes them and feeds them and takes care of them. He knows what they need. Look at these birds. And I can imagine people were sitting there looking out at the birds. And then he said, consider the lilies of the field. Consider the lilies of the field. God knows what they need. They are here today. And they are gone tomorrow. They are in the sun but for a short while. Yet, your heavenly Father knows what they need. And he clothes them with splendor. He more gloriously clothes them than Solomon was able to clothe himself. And Solomon had an unlimited checkbook, an unlimited number of servants who could go to wherever in the world to get the finest things. And God sees these things that are just here for a short while, how much more so will God take care of you? And then in the third kind of reminder that Jesus said, Jesus said, and, and, and don't worry about what you'll eat 
and what you'll drink and what you'll wear. The, the Gentiles and pagans and people that don't belong to me and people that don't trust in me, that's what they spend their lives chasing after. That's what they chase after. You know, and I thought, those are the most vivid illustrations. And I was reminded of a short story that, that Leo Tolstoy wrote. Over a hundred years ago, the great Russian novelist, he wrote this story, a short, profound little story entitled, How Much Land Does a Man Need? And he tells the story of this peasant and his wife, who by all indications are very happy with their lives. You know, they have enough to eat, everybody's healthy and happy, until her sister comes to town, and she's coming from the big city. And she describes, you know, in the city, it's shinier, and it's bigger, and it's nicer. And, you know, y'all ought to come move to the city. And they say, no, we're happy here. We have all that we need. And then the husband says, you know, but I will say, if I had just a little bit more land, I think we would be a little bit more secure. And so he began right then toiling for land. He began buying up little plots in his village. And then, then a large plot opened up, and the village wanted to come together and buy it so they could have a communal space that they could share. But he worked his way to try to buy off all of it and to shortcut his neighbors. Well, it didn't work, but the person selling it split it up into small pieces, so no more communal land. And then what? There's tension in the village. And so he decides, you know, I still need more land. I need more security. And so he decides to sell what he has there, and they move not too far away, and he has 125 acres. And it ought to be enough, but you know, it's not enough. And he heard that there was a kingdom not too far away that would give you all the land you wanted for 1,000 rubles. And so he made kind of a stealth trip to that land, and he looked and he saw that it was some nice land. It had some good pastures. It was very rich soil. And so he went to the king of that land, and the king said, yeah, a thousand rubles and you can have all that you want. Here's the way it works. When the sun comes up in the morning, you start walking and you make a big circle and you get back here by the time the sun comes down and you can have every bit of land that you walk around. You just mark your places along the land. And so sure enough, they start at the top of a hill and the next morning, the sun comes up, and he makes his mark, and he starts hiking. And he had, pre he had prepared, you know, he had a lunch pack, he had water, he was ready to make this trek. And so he goes, and he went hard downhill and way out, and he had honestly figured he could go probably 35 miles in one day. But you know what? He didn't realize how hot it was going to be and how rough the terrain was going to be. And lo and behold, by about lunchtime, he had skipped drinking water. He had skipped eating his food because he realized, I've bitten off more than I can chew. And early afternoon, he realized, I think I might have gone too far, but I can push myself. I can push. I can push. Walk, 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 walk. The sun setting when he can see the hill that he is supposed to get back to. The sun is just about to go behind, and so he begins running, and he runs with all his might up to the top of the hill, and as the sun sets... Right there. And he falls over dead. And his servant begins to, be, begins to dig a grave for him that's about six feet wide. And the question is, how much land does a man really need? About six feet. <laughs> you know, the passage we read is from the Sermon on the Mount. But this passage is recorded just about word for word in the Gospel of Luke in the 12th chapter. And it is recorded right after the parable of the rich fool who is faced with a generous harvest, a bounteous harvest. And he decides rather than taking just what he needs and sharing with his neighbors or enjoying and giving God the credit for the bounty, he says, I know what I will do. I will build bigger barns so that I can store more grain and so that I can be more secure and I can relax and eat, drink, and be merry because I can do all this. You know, Jesus said, don't worry about what you will eat or what you can drink or what you can wear. 
God knows what you need. God provides what you need. Um, you see, the disciple is to live by a different narrative, a different text, if you will. Um, because here's what the disciple is to do. He says, Jesus says, strive first for God's kingdom, strive first for his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus says the disciple strives for something different and depends on something greater than the anxious toil that he can produce and the reaching and the overreaching that he can do. Strive first for the kingdom, Jesus said. And he concluded this short passage by saying, Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring enough worries of, it, of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. I wonder if when he looked out at those disciples and if at his followers, he wanted them to witness by their lack of anxiety and their lack of worry and their dependence upon him and their recognition that God is the one who does the providing and the taking care of. God knows what you and I need. He knows what his followers need. And so I wonder if in this time of high anxiety, in these days of great worry, I wonder if Jesus would say to us, like he said to those people on that hillside, um, seek first God's kingdom. Seek first his righteousness and all this other. It'll be added to you as well. God knows what you need. Um, don't worry about tomorrow. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Please pray with me. Gracious God, in these moments, we come to you with our worries and our anxieties. We recognize that many of our labors have been anxious toil and striving and reaching and grasping. And we recognize that in some of those places we've not trusted in you. We've relied on our own insight. We've relied on our own abilities. And it's caused great anxiety. And in those places we have lost our joy. And we ask for your help and your hope and your strength today. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we sing a hymn of commitment. Sweet hour of prayer. It's hymn number 640. And I wonder if perhaps that's the place to start in giving our worries and our anxieties to God. You've all experienced the fact that a burden shared is a burden lightened. And Jesus has said on numerous occasions, Come to me. Come to me with all that you're carrying, all these heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Don't worry. Now don't be anxious. God knows what you need. Seek first his kingdom. Um, in these moments as we sing this beautiful old hymn, um, I invite you to respond. Perhaps it's in your attitude or in a prayer that you pray silently in your seat. If there's something you would like to share with me or the church, I'll be here to receive you. But use this time, a time of commitment, hymn 640, um, um, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Let's let's um, sing together. Please stand. As we conclude, um, every once in a while in literature or in poetry, there will be something that is just so appropriate to use in a church service. In this case, the literature and poetry happens to come from country music, something that I find a lot quicker than I find literature or poetry. But as we conclude, I wanted to share this song and invite you to, as you catch on and remember it, invite you to sing along, I think, a fitting closing prayer um, that, that captures part of the message of what Jesus was trying to do. One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking from you. 
Give me the strength to do every day what I have to do. Yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never be mine. So for my sake, Teach me to take one day at a time. We're going to do it one more time. And um, thank you for singing along. Brian and I had planned to do this together. <laughs> so thank you for helping. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all I'm asking from you. Give me the strength to do every day what I have to do. Yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never be mine. So for my sake, Teach me to take one day at a time. Let's tag that in. So for my sake, teach me to take one day at a time. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen.